Hi, everybody. So I am back for ENT surgery, chapter 17, otorhinolaryngolic surgery. So we are finally on nasal procedures. So we are right in the middle here. I will go ahead and share my screen so that you can follow along with me. So we're on nasal procedures, as I said. So it kind of goes right into nosebleeds. So epistaxis is the technical term that you need to know. There we go. So nasal surgery medications, there's a lot of them, and I want you to be very careful with them. So there's a separate section where I'm gonna go over this point, but this picture is also for epistaxis that you see on page 647. So that's where I'm starting. Now, again, you need to read over your diagnostic procedures and tests and your examinations, but I'm gonna focus on this nosebleed for just a moment. So out of all of this diagnostic procedures and tests, look at radiography with me. So see where it says epistaxis in purple? I'm kind of going to go to the bottom and then go back up. So epistaxis first. That is your nosebleed. If you just have a nosebleed, sometimes if you go into the ER to avoid going into surgery to, you know, ligate a vessel, if that's really what's pouring the blood out, they are going to try these medications. These medications are also what we use in surgery to, as like a nasal prep tray. So before the surgery, you're gonna have a little nasal prep tray with your cottonoids, a bayonet forceps, so that you can soak those cottonoids in either cocaine, lidocaine with epinephrine, or afrin. So you soak those cottonoids in, let's say afrin, because it's very commonly used. They will put it inside the nose. That's gonna be a topical anesthetic for them, especially if it's lidocaine or cocaine. And then it's gonna also be a vasoconstrictor to lessen the bleeding. So lots of people have used Afrin before to kind of clear their nasal passages. We do use that in surgery, um, but we're gonna do this to help lessen the bleeding. So know what these drugs are, know how they're going to be used in nasal surgery. What I want you to add with epistaxis or just know that the slide goes with it is if your nose is bleeding and they want to avoid taking you up to surgery to explore, this is what they're going to try first. So it's kind of a twofold. It's what we use in the operating room, all the drugs you're going to use, but also fun fact, this is how they're going to try to stop your nose bleed in the ER before going to the OR. Now I'll go back up to radiography. So this part's a little bit easier because there is there are pictures of this in your book, but it's on a different page. So under radiography, they're gonna use a lot of radiography to see the nasal bones and the sinuses. Because of that, you do actually need to know the names of these different x-rays. So four basic views, Walter's view, Caldwell view, lateral, you should know that one, and submental view. So these are very specific to see the four major nasal sinuses. Because you need to know them, you need a visual to go with it. So write down for yourself on page 661, that's where all your images for those x-rays are. So make sure you are familiar with those and you can tell the difference between all four. After that, you'll see CT is rapidly replacing these x-rays. So CT scanning is gonna give you a very clear, um, sorry, it's gonna give you very clear delineation between bony and soft tissue structures. So they both provide a good picture, but CT is gonna give that soft structure comparison. So you can easily compare the two structures because think about the nose. We have a lot of soft tissue, but we also have that cartilage, right? So you wanna be able to tell where it's real bone, where it's cartilage, where it's soft tissue. Can't really see all that on the x-ray. So know a little bit of your imaging for nasal procedures. Okay, now let's go to routine instruments, equipment, and supplies. So, oops. So I will stay right there because you'll see some of the supplies, but not the equipment. Headlamp. So headlamp you're gonna use with multiple different um, surgeries. And I'll point out what the headlamp looks like when I get to that slide, but all through e, ENT, so ear, nose, and throat surgeries, a lot of the surgeons are gonna be wearing a headlamp because where they're looking, it's very hard to see. So they need that extra light. Even with the three OR lights, it's not bright enough. So they need a headlamp. Drills, of course, just like in ear surgery. And as you read through the rest of these, I want you to point, I want you to see that yes, we're using Bovi like we do in other 
um, specialties, so monopolar or BOBI, but I also want you to see that when they use the ESU, they like to use it with a suction attachment. So I've said this in class, there's lots of throat cancers and same thing in the nose, nasal cancers do. You don't wanna breathe that in. So if you can, you want the suction to go with these bovies so that it is sucking up the plume immediately so you're not breathing in any of that. Okay, after that, I wanna also point out bipolar units. So remember what your bipolar forcep looks like and know that we're gonna use that in ENT more often than that monopolar. Sometimes it's like we're opening with the monopolar bovie. So we made the incision and then we use the bovie to dissect down, but once we get down in it and we can see the vessels, we're not gonna bovie through those. They're small, delicate vessels and we are going to bipolar around them. So remember it has two tips and we can wrap around the vessel and sear it off that way. So know you're gonna be using more bipolar. As we go through the rest of it, see where it says U-drape? You'll see split drape in orthopedics so that we can flit a, fit around a limb. So it splits like this so you can wrap around the limb with the drape. It's the same thing with the U-drape for the head. So we're wanting it to be able to wrap around the head so that we can access the nose during the case. So that's what a U-drape is. Where it says prep set, that's what I talked about on this slide, having a nasal prep tray. And of course, suction for every case. As I said on the ear lecture, I'm not gonna go through the instruments because I went through those in class. If you were not in class, I'll say you need to know all of these instruments that are in your book. It is a lot of instrumentation, so get out your orange book and compare them with these pictures in the book so you can better understand. For your practical considerations, positioning is key for ENT. So I want you to know typically what they're gonna be positioned at. Let's make some bullets going right down this first paragraph. First thing, supine. Second thing, their head's on a donut, and we're going to put a shoulder roll behind their shoulders. So your book says placed on a donut, their head is, and or on a roll placed under the scapular region. So right where it says scapular region, I want you to put layman's terms, what they're gonna call it in the OR. They're gonna say, make me a shoulder roll. That means get a sheet, fold it about this thin, roll it, and put it under the patient's shoulders. This allows the right positioning. So their shoulders are out, so their neck and their nose, most importantly, is up. So that's the right position for these kinds of cases. I wanna also point out all ENT. All ENT, it talks about protecting the ulnar nerves, making sure they're well padded on the arms. That's every case all the time. It's focusing on it here because your arms might be tucked in. So instead of being out on the arm board, you know that draw sheet that's underneath you, you can use that to tuck the arms in on these cases. That allows the surgeon to get right up on the patient and right next to their head, whereas if the arms were out, they'd have something blocking them. So when you tuck those arms, you have to be even more vigilant about padding the ulnar nerve. So many, that's actually a really common side effect of any surgery. You'll go to sleep and have surgery on your nose and then you wake up and your arm, you can't feel it because you had nerve damage from being positioned incorrectly. So that's actually very common. You don't wanna make that mistake. So padding the arm, the ulnar nerve, very important. Okay. After all of these instruments, I'm gonna to flip to page 651. Okay, here is where you're going to see the topical anesthetics that I'm talking about on this page. I told you it was for epistaxis, the nosebleed, but it's also for right here, 651. So topical anesthetic, 4% cocaine. Your other option for local anesthetic, it says with or without epirin without epinephrine. So yes, that's your surgeon's preference. I put this on your slide for a reason. They're typically gonna go with epinephrine because the nose bleeds so much, we need that extra epi to help with the vasoconstriction. Okay, as you keep going, I wanna point out just protecting the eyes. This next paragraph talks about protecting the eyes during cases, that's very important. Protect it from the surgeon and protect it from the prep going into the eye anything you can to protect the eye when you're working on the face. Okay, flip it over, 652. 
So it goes through a, th a few more instruments and then it goes right into a septoplasty. So I will start with that. Septoplasty, or as it says in your book, SMR. So know what SMR stands for, submucosal resection. So that's the actual tissue type that we're resecting. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, break it down small. So submucus, submucus resection. So the mucous membrane, the lining of the inside of your nose, the nasal cavity, will be incised and that underlining periosteum is lifted. Remember, periosteum is covering all bone. That's why we use the Freer elevator or any other periosteal elevator to scrape that periosteum off of the bone so that it can be freed. Now, we do this in orthopedics so that the bone isn't smooth anymore and we can set a fracture, like put a drill through it and plates and screws. We don't need that. Um, we don't need that periosteum over the bone there. Here, it's because we are lining everything up because of their deviated septum. So that's why we're lifting that pericardium here. But understand it's a submucosa resection, SMR, and it's a septoplasty. So look at page 653, top of the page. I want you to know that the structures underlying this mucous membrane, if they remove it, it's going to help restore the breathing. So if you have a deviated septum, as it shows here, it's going to stop your proper breathing from happening. So this is going to restore normal breathing. Uh, when it's put back into position, I want you to know they're gonna end this case with nasal packing. So that's the next thing it says at the top of the page, nasal packing. So your SMR septoplasty, where it says that on 653, know that that's to straighten your deviated septum. I also want you to point out, keep reading through this paragraph. Care must be taken to not perforate the septum or cause weakness to that septum. It could cause a future deformity. If you can't understand this, this tissue is super delicate. So you have cartilage, very delicate. It's not like other bone. So because of that, the more you mess with it, the more it's gonna fall apart. That's why you see people with, who have multiple plastic surgeries on their nose it's almost as if it caves in after a while because you can only reconstruct that tissue so many times. It's delicate, fine tissue. The only note you need to make there is that this is delicate tissue you're working on. It could cause a future deformity if you don't do it properly. Okay, so looking at your procedure, 17-6, know your Second bullet point, nasal septum is typically straight up birth. During aging, the septum tends to deviate to one side or the other. So that septum can also be deviated due to trauma. So you get punched in the nose, <laughs> you fall on your face, something like that, you have a deviated septum. If you're not breathing properly, if it's obstructing your breathing, that needs to be fixed. So look at your right side of the page, first bullet point. If the deviation is severe, the patient may experience difficult breathing due to that obstruction. So this happens more often in older patients. That's just their airways are more uh, closed at this point, or they might have other things that are blocking their airway. So older patients typically have that, but that can happen on any case. So know that that septoplasty is not just for cosmetic reasons. It is to help them breathe properly again. Okay, on this case, I won't go through it step by step, but I wanna hit a couple things, 654. So we're gonna soak those cotinoids and use that nasal prep tray to insert those sponges before the case. Then we're gonna drape out and do the case. So step one, it says cocaine soaked cotinoids. Remember, it could be lidocaine, it could be Afrin. There's many different options for the surgeon. After that, look at number two. They're gonna open that septum. They're gonna put a speculum inside the nose. The first thing they're gonna use is the caudal. So under your procedural consideration, that number two, provide the surgeon with a nasal speculum and then caudal clamp may be used for incision. Not sure why they put caudal clamp, so we will fix that. Caudal elevator. So caudal elevator, they're gonna use it like a freer elevator to elevate some of that periosteum later and also right now to kind of make that incision to get in there. The cartilage is in size and then that mucous membrane is elevated. So from there they can kind of reshape how they want this to look. You'll be doing more of the suctioning on this case.
Look at 655, top of the page, number four. Look at the procedural consideration. Continue to provide that suction, but this is where you get to do the fun part. So if they need to chisel on that uh, cartilage or that bone, the surgical tech is gonna be asked to tap the chisel or osteotome, more commonly used, um, during this case. So on this, no, it's not like orthopedic surgery where you're gonna whack it like a hammer. It's just tap, tap. Now you wanna do it with confidence and be deliberate about it, but you also don't wanna break somebody's nose. So go gentle the first time, I would suggest, because the surgeon can always say, okay, give it a little more. They can always push you along a little bit more, but you can't undo breaking somebody's nose. So on number four, know you're gonna have that mallet, number one, to tap for the surgeon. Next, you're gonna need your bayonet or your Takahashi forceps. Make sure you know that. Remember, Takahashi forceps are also called pituitary rongeurs in neurosurgery. Okay, after that, they're going to basically fix up what they have done from the tapping. And once they get it, or that cartilage where they want it, they get the achieved look and airflow, then they are going to achieve hemostasis like we do at the end of all cases. But again, we're in the nose. The nose bleeds a lot. So we're gonna have to try a little bit harder to achieve that hemostasis. So no for this one, we might put internal splints inside the nose. And I know we took pictures of those and they are on your Facebook page. Okay, 655, bottom of the page, Carla was done. This is what I told you in class. If any cocaine is left at the end of the procedure, be sure that it is irretrievably discarded. For legal reasons, accountability, the surgical tech should ask the circulator to observe the discard process. I wanna do this with all drugs. I want them to watch me get rid of it so they know I don't have anything to do with that drug. Now in general, we use a lot of local anesthetic, so lidocaine with epi, something like that. You're gonna use it all or there might just be this much liquid in the bottom of your med cup at the end of your case and you're gonna wrap it all up and throw it in the trash. This is talking about there's a good amount of liquid left, but it's kind of different with cocaine. So we wanna treat that drug a little bit differently. Okay, after septoplasty, you will see turbinectomy. So my picture is of a polypectomy. My picture is of a polypectomy because you're still gonna be able to see the turbinates in this picture. So you can see the middle turbinate very well in this picture. Same process, getting in the nose and removing the polyp off of that turbinate is the difference. So on the turbinectomy, let's go through that one. Know your nasal cavities. Now it has a series of four bony projections. So those bony projections are called turbinates or the conche. So know both terms for that. Now let's look down at the bottom surgical procedure. I'm gonna break this down and make it a little bit easier. All of your terms that are in italics, I'd like you to highlight that. So let's start from the left to side of the page. Inferior turbinateectomy. Your next one, micro debrider turbinectomy. Third option, laser turbinectomy. And then specifically the YAG laser. Okay, so now you have your three options. So inferior turbinectomy, we're gonna actually open it up. Micro debrider, this is one, I had a surgeon that called it a rotor rooter. This is the one that you're gonna use a camera and a light cord on one side. And on the other side, you're gonna use this micro debrider, AKA rotor rooter. It's going to turn around and suck up all of these pieces of the turbinate that you want out. So it's cutting and sucking it inside this tube and it's bringing it right into the suction machine as you're working. So you're rotor rootering the nose, getting that turbinate out of there with a micro debrider. So no for that one, because you might use a imaging system with it, you're still going to be using a camera and a light cord too. So that's how you're getting this view that I'm looking at of the polyp right here. That's how you're seeing that view of the turbinate is with a endoscope with a camera up the nose. Um, and then of course your last option is the laser. So with lots of things in ENT surgery, there's always the option of the laser. So you can read more detail and figure out why the surgeon chooses laser versus micro debrider versus open. 
but there's a lot of specific reasons and we don't really need to focus on that as a script tag. So if you have questions about that, you can ask me or you can research more into it. But right now I want you to think about the script tag. What does the script tag need? So now you've got three different options and you know for that second option, the micro debrider, you're gonna need a camera, a light cord, and an endoscope. Okay, now I can go to Paula back to me, 657. So Paula back to me, you can see we are removing the polyps. So you see what a polyp is on 657? Growths um, that originate from the mucous membrane. So that's why you see it right there in the nose off that mucous membrane. So we're gonna go in same way, typically with the micro debrider. So flip it over to 658. Practical considerations, micro debrider may be used for removal of polyps. Now, there's a polyp snare that you could use. There's different biting graspers that you can use in endonasal surgery. So there's different ways to get it out. I just want you to know a couple of them. So as it says in your book, micro debrider, or as I told you and showed you in class, a snare. So you can put that snare up the nose, they lasso around it and pull it out. That's more of the old school way of doing it. So let's look at number three. It goes through the surgery step by step, but it's removing the polyp. Looking at number three, you can see they can also use that polyp snare to do this case. So now you've got some options for turbinectomy and polypectomy. But and nasal polyps are super common in Oklahoma because we've got a lot of Oklahoma allergies that cause issues and polyps are going to develop. Okay, the next one I do not have a picture for. It's going to go into FES, which is kind of some of your options we've been talking about. So the micro debrider case where you're going to go up the nose, it's endoscopic sinus surgery. It just doesn't have that F in front of it unless it's functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So if we're navigating, they'll probably call it F-E-S-S. But if you're doing something specific, it might just say FES with polypectomy or FES with, oh, not that one, turbinectomy, <laughs> not with a septoplasty. So you'll see some of these cases up on the OR board as a combine of what you're seeing in the book. So coneal atresia repair. There's really nothing I have to add to this one and it's not as commonly done. So I just want you to read through this one and know that coneal atresia is a congenital defect. So this one we can go in and repair. It's a congenital defect and we can go in and repair it just like your septoplasty or any of these other cases. But it's gonna usually be an endoscopic technique so the FES. So 659, very right side of the page. See where it says endoscopic technique? This is what I was talking about. Camera, light cord to get into the nose and look. Now there's another technique for this one. You can use a transeptal technique. So you can actually make an incision into the septum, but we always want to go minimally invasive as possible for our patients. Now I can go on to FES, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So know this anatomy, really look over the bottom of 659. Know your four pairs of sinuses, all of the bones that go with it. And I've got some good pictures that I've added to MCC. It just says ENT pictures. So if you're having trouble remembering the anatomy, you can use that to review. So frontal sinuses are located in that frontal bone behind the eye and the eyebrows and may be in one cavity or divided. It's focusing on that frontal sinus for a moment because a lot of the sinus surgery, we can get all the way up into that frontal sinus. Okay, on page 660, you see a good picture of your sinuses. Note where your ethmoid is because it looks different depending on which view you're looking at, right? So A, you can see your ethmoid and B, you can see it right here. So it has a different view depending on how you're looking at it. Don't let that confuse you. On 661, you will see these pictures that I was talking about for your x-rays that you need to understand. So there's a picture of your Walters and your Caldwell x-ray. So you can understand the view. Okay, on 661, it gets into your ethmoid sinuses and you see that it's located between the eyes right there. So hopefully you're matching up that with your picture. Then there's the sphenoid sinus, maxillary sinuses, 
that you're gonna see on these cases also. Your next bullet point after your sinuses, it talks about why we're doing a FEST. Now you can do it just for diagnostic or you can actually be treating sinus issues. So sinus issues, anatomical defects, inflammation, and chronic sinusitis. So go ahead and highlight chronic sinusitis. Go ahead and call that Oklahoma's issue. <laughs> I know we're not the only ones, but again, we have lots of nasal surgery due to the allergies that we have here and chronic sinusitis. That is the proper term. So after that, you'll see, let's look at equipment, instruments, and supplies. So you know already, you need a camera, a light cord, an endoscope, and a FRED. What I want you to know, a little more detail now, four or five millimeter sinoscopes. Now, if you use a 10 millimeter scope like we use in general surgery, that's not gonna fit up the average nose. So four to five millimeter sinoscopes. Also the varying degrees, it goes all the way from zero to 120. Think about the small hole we're in. If we need to completely see backwards, we might have that really angled lens. So it hits all different varying angles so that the surgeon can see every angle. And for you, that means you're gonna be trading out different scopes quite often for the surgeon. And every time you trade out a scope, you need to wipe it on that thread sponge with a thread on it so it does not fog up during the case. That's your anti-fog solution. Make sure you use it. And then after that, navigational systems. So navigational systems are really cool, especially for tumors, because they can give you a live view of the tumor and you get a handpiece, a probe to use. So they can stick it inside the nose while they have the scope down the other nostril and look up at their imaging screen. So it's gonna show them like a live view of their CT scan. So as they're holding the probe, if they change direction, the image changes direction. So there's no room for error. They can't really, it's, they've made it too easy for the surgeons now. They can't mess it up because they have that navigation guiding them. So that's what you will see pretty commonly on FES cases. So I won't go through this procedure because every FES you could be doing something different. You could be repairing something different. You could be taking part of the ethmoid out. You could just be taking diseased tissue out. I've done this specific case for patients that uh, have high drug use and because of that, they had fungus inside their sinuses. They were constantly sniff, snorting drugs. It landed on their sinuses. It sat there, moist area, breeding ground for that bacteria. So infection ensued inside their nose. So. You can do so many different things with a FES. I will not go through this procedure. Just read and understand that this is a case where you're gonna be taking biopsies usually, and you need to kind of be ready for anything. So endoscope, your dressing for the end is typically just antibiotic ointment. Um, it says a mustache dressing is applied. Sometimes that's just under the nose, but we like to do nasal packing to make sure that nose is not bleeding any extra. Okay, switch over to page 664. Your Caldwell Luke procedure. So your Caldwell Luke, here's what I want you to put at the very top of the page. The FES is now preferred. So this is a very invasive procedure. You can see it on page 665. They actually make an incision inside the mouth into the gingiva to get into the sinus. So they are trying to get into the sinus um, they typically did this on pediatric patients. So let's look at your practical considerations. Caldwell loop is contraindicated in pediatric patients prior to the descent of the permanent teeth. So as I said, I've seen this on kids, but note it says prior to the descent of the permanent teeth. Now I hope you see why, because of where we're making that incision in the gingiva inside the mouth. So there's multiple reasons to not want to do this case anymore. We're making an incision inside the mouth. That's a super dirty area. I mean, I know we're going up the, the nose with the camera, which is also dirty, but I think your mouth has a little bit more bacteria in there. So you are cutting into the mouth. So you're asking for an infection is the way I'm looking at it. And more importantly, we're really invasive here. We want to go less invasive. So if we can, we're going to go less invasive and do a FES to deal with this. Let's go back to the top of 664. 
your second bullet point. The purpose of the procedure is to remove the diseased portions of the antral wall to evacuate the sinus contents, which is what we do in a fess, and establish drainage through the nose. So that means they used to do a Caldwell loop to clear out that sinus and to allow the nose to drain. There's no reason for us to approach it that way if we can address the problem through the nose minimally invasive. Okay, so that is FES, that was your sinus surgeries. I wanna look at those instruments for a moment. So you'll see lots of different FES instruments and it's a little bit overwhelming. What I want you to see is that they all are kind of based off of that Takahashi forcep, right? Takahashi forcep, but they all have different angles. So it might have very specific names. And when you go do a FES, you can go learn every single one of those names. But I want you to glance over what's in the book. So if they said a name, you'd be able to pick it out if you had a bunch of instruments on your Mayo, just like this picture. Now there's many surgeons who just describe what the forcep looks like. So they might say up angled pituitary rondure. That's this one right here. It's angled up. Regular pituitary rondure right there. Uh, they have scissors that cut backwards, scissors that cut to the right and the left. They'll say right or left scissors. So some of them are nice and simple and they don't have special names. So read through those so that you can anticipate what your surgeon needs, even if you don't know the specific instrument names, because there are so many. Okay, now we are into throat surgery. I was going to separate the two, but I'm so close, I might as well keep going. So for throat surgery, my biggest thing is safety. This is because I've seen a ray tech left inside a patient. Uh, this almost occluded their airway, it was very dangerous. So I don't want that to ever happen to you. I don't want you to hear anything about that. So you're gonna learn safety. So throat surgery, they typically put a throat pack in. This throat pack is a moist ray tech. They're gonna place it in the throat, specifically the pharynx. So if the patient has an endotracheal tube in place, that ray tech's right on top of it. So extreme care is taken to avoid leaving a sponge inside the pharynx as it could occlude the airway. So when you have this throat pack out, I have a picture of a tonsil clamp up there for a reason. You're going to clamp this tonsil to your Mayo stand as an indicator, not only to you, but to the surgeon and anybody else in the room that, hey, there's a throat pack in the throat. We are not gonna leave that there. You can even say this out loud to your circulator so the nurse can write it on the board. So then when you're doing the counts, you have yet another reminder that there's a throat pack in. Doesn't hurt to have two reminders. Makes me sleep better at night. So throat surgery safety, make sure you read through this and understand it. This is something that if you have any questions on, please ask me because I need you to understand the safety portions of this chapter. So that was my part about throat packs. I think I can go into scopes after this. Oh, this part of the book is a little boring and I went ahead and gave you some pictures because they did not. So again, I'm not gonna go through your diagnostic procedures and tests. Make sure you really read through those. Where I will stop, um, polysomography, there it is, 667, top of the page. I'm stopping at this one because it's very different than the rest. Polysomography is examination used to diagnose sleep apnea and determine its severity. Because this test isn't well known and easily forgotten, I wanted to point that one out to you. Make sure you know that one. Now your x-rays and CT scans, MRIs, I've kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, what I would more look at is your instruments. There's just so many instruments on this one. So routine instruments, equipment, and supplies. You're gonna see these basic instrument trays and I'm gonna go through a tracheotomy with you. So let's flip over these instruments that I went over in class. You need to know them all. So for a laryngoscopy, look at page 669, bottom of the page. They're gonna use operating microscope and use this laryngoscope to do laryngoscopy. So if it's micro laryngoscopy, you know I need that microscope. If they're using a laser with it, you know I need the ebonized version of this so the laser can't reflect back into my eyes. Things like that you're gonna have to anticipate. But as far as what the scope looks like, it just goes up in size. 
So laryngoscope is fairly small, esophagoscope bigger, bronchoscope biggest. So now hopefully you can understand that. As far as putting to get them together, this is another thing that you're gonna learn hands-on as an extern for the first time. So they'll teach you how to put these pieces together and how to take it apart properly for SPD. On that operating microscope, so on 669, right under all your bullet points, and you do need to read all of those bullet points, the operating microscope is a critical part of laryngeal surgery. So that means if you have a tumor on your larynx, they are gonna use a microscope to zoom in on there to get that tumor off. So lots of cancer on these cases. Make sure you, if you don't have suction attached to your cautery, you're sucking up that plume. If you're using laser, make sure you're using the proper mask and protecting yourself. You do not wanna breathe in those carcinogens. Okay, for the objective lens, very odd question I ask. So you might set up the microscope and drape it, but a lot of the times you're not paying attention to the size of the lens. So I want you to pay attention to this part. The microscope should be brought into the operating room and set up in advance for surgery. A 400 lens is commonly used. So just so you know, it's talking about the objective power lens. So if you understand a microscope and how it works, if you're wondering more details, there's your more details. The objective power lens is gonna be 400. For me, it was just something I memorized. Okay, 400 lens for my microscope. This isn't something you have to trade out, anything like that. It's just gonna be a 400, something you need to know. Another thing you need to know, there's gonna be sitting stools on these cases. So it's non-sterile. They're just gonna sit so they can comfortably see the larynx as they're doing this case. And same thing with the esophagus and the bronch. Flip it over to page 670. So I want you to know with the bronchoscopes, that first paragraph, this can be available in rigid, as you see here, or flexible. If you get into the flexible one, it is sterilized in a totally different manner. And usually if it gets into the flexible, we're getting into that thoracic cavity, we're really in the bronchus or the bronchial tree even. So we are going to move that on to a thoracic surgeon at that point. Okay, you can see a picture of your laryngoscope at 670 and the top, your esophagoscope, but I included some pictures for you and some of the graspers that go along with it so you understand how we're sending an instrument down a working channel to take a specimen while we have this very small tube inside their throat. Okay, let's look at practical considerations. Practical considerations, these are non-sterile cases. Non-sterile cases. For that reason, you're gonna be doing more of the positioning, prepping, helping out. So, under your practical considerations, the patient might be supine with the arm tucked, scapular towel roll, here's where I want you to put shoulder roll again, will be used to hyperextend the neck. So same thing with nasal procedures, but even higher up with that shoulder roll so we can extend the neck. We want to have easy access. Okay, bottom of this paragraph. This should be prepared in advance um, of the patient entering the room. Suggested supplies for this clean setup. Again, it's saying clean setup because it's not sterile. So you're, you will see many scrub techs treat it like the Cisto room. They'll put on sterile gloves, grab the instruments out of the case, open a sterile specimen cup, as it says, and a couple other supplies, but they're not even gonna gown and glove for this case and to set it up because it's not a sterile case, it's clean. We're still gonna use sterile gloves. We're gonna treat it like it's sterile, but our scrubs are right next to the table instead of 12 inches away that's perfectly fine, it's not a sterile procedure. Make sure you really read through this section because I know there's not a lot of images and stuff and I want you to understand the purpose of these three different scopes. Okay, this one really breaks down what all equipment is in there. So you can see, finally, our light source. So this is the light source that your surgeon is gonna use for their personal headlamp. So I told you throughout this chapter that many cases they're gonna wear a headlight. What I didn't add in is that you can use this headlight as a light source for your laryngoscope. So instead of bringing in a whole tower, laparoscopic tower, we would always just bring in a light source because that's all we're plugging in. There's no camera to plug in. 
they're looking with their eyes or through the microscope. So because of that, we just need the extra light. So this light is going to be hooked onto the laryngoscope so we can see deep into the throat. There are some surgeons who are gonna wear their headlight and hook this light onto a light source. So know how many light sources you need in the room. Also note all these pieces. When you open this tray, you're not gonna know how to put all these pieces together. It's a good time as an extern to show what you know, set up what you can, and then leave all these pieces out nice and organized and then ask the preceptor, okay, I've never done this part before. How do I put this together? I can coach you on how to do it. The stuff you will need to do any of these three scopes, headlight, light source, light cord for the scope right here, specimen cup, tooth guard. So we're sticking the scope right over their teeth. So the, in the mouth's not sterile, the tooth guard's not sterile. They're just gonna put it right in their mouth with regular exam gloves, but definitely need that tooth guard. If you are part of knocking a tooth out, you will not forget that tooth guard ever again. If you see that happen in person. So that's everything you need for your scopes. Let's move on to tonsils and adenoids. So TNA is the most common, maybe ear tubes, if not. I was gonna say it's the most common ENT surgery you're going to do at a typical place. So typical small hospital, ENT consists of ear tubes and tonsils and adenoids. So more involved, bigger hospitals, that's where you're gonna get into the neck dissections, uh, the laryngectomies where we're putting in voice prosthesis for these patients, these free flaps that you see at the end of the, the chapter. These are big cases that they do at teaching hospitals. That's the kind of ENT that I like, but most places you're gonna have tonsils and adenoids and ear tubes, things like that as your ENT cases. So I just wanted to point that out. So tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, almost but not always done together. So make sure you really review this anatomy. I've had some students get confused on which one is which, so I included a picture now for you. So you can see the palatine tonsils, the tonsils are in the oropharynx, so they're in the mouth, oro is an oral. Your adenoids, your pharyngeal tonsils are in the nasopharynx, so they're basically up in your nose, your adenoids are. So palatine tonsils are tonsils in the oropharynx. Pharyngeal tonsils are adenoids in the nasopharynx. So now you have that written out for you, black and white, so you can study that and never get those two easy things mixed up. Okay, it talks about pharyngeal tonsils, adenoids, regular tonsils. Here in your book on the center section, I want you to find where it talks about the adenoids shrinking in your book. So it's the center section toward the bottom of the page. So it says that it's lymphatic tissue, that's correct, your adenoids are lymphatic tissue of the tonsils, and they begin to shrink after about age seven. So it's like they atrophy with age, that's the note that you can make. So they're gonna shrink after age seven, they're atrophying with age. Okay, I think I went over that anatomy on that page. Let's flip it over to 672. It gets more into the anatomy. Why are we usually doing this case? Tonsillitis, that's what I want you to see. So tonsillitis, it's all inflamed, and that can be both your pharyngeal and palatine tonsils are inflamed, so that's why we're going in and removing these. So tonsillitis of the palatine tonsils can be acute or chronic, most often it's caused by strep, streptococcal organism. So acute tonsillitis and inflammation of the tonsils and their crypts. So anything back in the throat is gonna be inflamed and angry until we get those out because they're taking up too much room in there because you have that acute or chronic infection happening. Okay. Look at page 673, you can see a good picture of what these inflamed um, adenoids can look like. Find where it says in bright purple, hypertrophy, recurrent adenoiditis, so inflamed adenoids can lead to hypertrophy. So hypertrophic tissue 
can cause snoring due to that nasal obstruction. So you're gonna have more problems if you don't get this fixed is what it's telling you. And then again, this procedure is gonna be called a T and A for tonsils and adenoids. Okay, this one for the draping, you're gonna make a head drape. So here's your setup, two different surgeons, two different um, setups. So every surgeon does a little bit different, but should have the same basics. You're gonna need a mouth gag to get in there and some other basics to remove the tonsils and adenoids. As I said in class, you saw those big instruments like the adenotome that can cut off the adenoid, that Fisher tonsil knife that cuts off the tonsil, the 12 blade that bends backward to cut off the tonsil. Again, those are all old school ways of removing the tonsils and adenoids. That doesn't mean there's not a surgeon left that still does it. But more commonly, we are going to use something like this suction bovi to coagulate as we're doing this case. There's different tricks. So like you can use a red rubber catheter to kind of wrap around and do some tricks to get these out quicker and easier. But every surgeon is different. So you need to watch a YouTube video and see one of the options of how they're gonna do this one. But let's look at your draping. Now for this one, you might have to make a head drape, which means you're gonna need one or two of those half sheets as I was talking about, and a towel and a towel clip. So it's what I described to you before. You're gonna wrap it around their head and put a towel clip here so all their hair is out of your way. Okay.